Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Healing and Freedom Journey. I'm your brother from another mother, Mark DeJesus, bringing you insights and encouragement to help support your journey when it comes to mental, emotional, and relationship health. Today, what I want to get into is another step in a series on narcissism. I've been doing my best to bring out biblical insights to help your discernment, to become aware in your life and relationships, especially in how narcissism may have affected your journey, especially in your upbringing and and in your relationships. But in the midst of this, I know there are many, when they hear this subject, they start to spin. Even if they see the icon in their feed of videos or an article, they start to spin and they begin to ask themselves the question in panic, "Ah, am I a narcissist? They start to spin and spiral and even catastrophize, oh no, am I a narcissist? So what I want to do is I want to address that today, and I also want to get into four signs you're not a narcissist. But what I would like to land this broadcast into is recognizing narcissistic tendencies that we all can be aware of so that we can heal, mature, and grow and enhance our relationship feel, because all of us could benefit from that. I'm all about looking at subjects with sobriety, not denial and not panicking. I believe in compassionate sobriety. So we see things for what they are so that all of us can grow together in our journey. Now, the subject of narcissism, it gets thrown around so much that it can lose context and definition of what it actually means. Many people can throw it around flippantly. It could lose its meaning and and, and what it's really supposed to communicate. Many times we can just throw it at someone that annoys us as a label, and maybe they have one attribute of narcissism, so we throw that label at them. What I want to do is just ground us a little bit more and not jump into those patterns. The thing that I want to get into first is, can we all recognize that there's a bit of narcissistic tendencies that we can all at times manifest in our life, in our journey, we can admit, okay, we get entitled to what we think we deserve. We can get upset when we don't get in life what we think we are owed. That entitlement can creep in, right? At times we feel superior. Why? Because we're comparing ourselves. We're competing. We have this competitive comparison going on with us and other people. There are times that we feel very envious. It doesn't mean you're narcissistic, but these are some of the tendencies that are involved in narcissism. We can all in our battle get very self-consumed, can't we? We can at moments get too much all about ourselves, too much in what we're going through, what's happening with us, get too focused on that. So it's good to recognize these as tendencies because then we can all take a deep breath and go, you know what? We all need some healing. We all need some growing. We all need some maturing in our journey. So let me get into four simple reasons to know that you're not a narcissist. Number one is you're asking. If you're a narcissist. Now, many hear that and kind of dismiss it. Like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Well, because people who ask that are actually interested in working on their inner life. You're actually seeking to better your emotions, your mental health, your relationships. You want to grow. You want to work through things. This is one of the problematic things about true narcissists is they aren't working on their inner life. They're actually working on protecting their outer shell. They don't get counseling, and if they do, it's usually because a spouse is dragging them into it, or they um, might be a vulnerable narcissist, and they just want to want to keep protecting their narcissistic self pity story, and they don't they don't they don't actually stick with any help. Um, but that's a whole other tangent for itself. If you're simply asking, you're not. But do you have some tendencies? You may, and it's okay because all of us are learning to work on those areas. The second thing is that you practice genuine empathy towards the important people in your life. 
Now, empathy is something that is exercised to those that you are close to, those that you are connected to. Empathy, I've, I've done that in a whole other broadcast about uh, how to balance out empathy. You can check that out and what empathy looks like and how to navigate that. But the, the true narcissists do not have genuine empathy, especially towards those that they are to care for. They might project an empathy from a stage or from a presentation, but not where it's meaningful to those they're married to, children, to close relationships, long-term meaningful relationships. Number three is that you're able to admit when you are wrong and apologize. Now, listen, everyone struggles with this, right? We get prideful, we get stubborn, we get defensive, but at some point you are able to say the words, I was wrong, I'm sorry. What is this? This is a lifestyle of being willing to be vulnerable, willing to humble yourselves. Can we all be stubborn? Yeah. When arguments happen, can your stubbornness kick up? Yeah. Does it mean you're a narcissist? No. <laughs> but at times, you can look back and go, you were willing to say, I'm sorry. Now, narcissists don't do that. If they do, they go, I'm sorry you feel that way. Well, I'm sorry your feelings were hurt. <laughs> That even in an attempted apology, it's, it's dismissive. But when you come across the wrong way, when you truly come across the wrong way, you're willing to admit it, you're willing to work on yourself, okay? Number four is you're willing to receive in some form and fashion counsel, feedback, and correction. You're willing to get help where you can. You're willing to make necessary adjustments. And like I said, Narcissists only go to counseling when their spouse drags them in because they're threatening to divorce them. And those are usually grandiose narcissists. Or if they're a vulnerable narcissist, they want to remain kind of in that victimhood picture. Because remember, narcissists are either the greatest victors or the greatest victims. And in that second option, the vulnerable narcissist, they, they can't stay with a counselor too, too long because eventually the, the counselor starts working on things and it threatens the story that they have. So uh, for, for so many of you, if you're watching this video, you're wanting to receive counsel. You're wanting to receive feedback. You're wanting healthy correction. Now, again, for all of us, is sometimes correction scary? Yes. Is, sometimes, is, there, is correction sometimes a lot of times scary? <laughs> yes. But you're willing to go, mm, okay, I'm willing to learn. This, what I'm covering here, for the most part, is the life of humility. It's like, I'm willing to work. I know I got goofiness. I know I got brokenness. I know I got areas to work on. I'm willing to. How do I do that? That's the process of humility. Now, what I would like to encourage is I'd like to encourage in our journey how all of us can work on and heal through narcissistic tendencies. Okay? Let's not just slap labels on yourself. Everybody relax. Everybody calm down. But let's recognize tendencies. And what I want to do is I want to... I want to direct us towards healthy patterns rather than focusing on all the bad narcissistic traits. Oh no, let's take five main ones and let's fuel healthy directions. Okay. The first one is a narcissist is always the center of attention. Why don't all of us start to be mindful? You know what? I want to on a daily and regular basis. I want to see other people shine. I want to see them shine by the way I encourage them. I want to encourage people when I'm around them. I want to find ways to celebrate when they win, even if it hits something in me. Oh, I'm jealous of that. Oh. What about me? That I go, you know what? I want to celebrate this person. It's not healthy to stare at yourself all day. True narcissists, in all they're doing, it's all about themselves. And it's all about reflecting back to the image that they carry, the highly constructed image. And Paul gives an instruction in Philippians 2. He said, let each of you not only look out for his own interests, because it is important that you be aware of your needs and you, and you take care of yourself. It's not, being a Christian is not completely ignoring everything in your life. And just many people struggle with that, by the way. Many Christians battle with that. They're so outward focused. They ignore many of the broken, eroding areas of their life. 
He's saying here, don't just look out only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. And this is why I teach so much on the flow of love. I'm learning to receive God's love, to see myself through that love, and that love I'm receiving, immediately I want it to flow out. I want my eyes to be up so that as I receive, what I've taken in is flowing out of my life. And so many times when we get stuck in our journey, you can ask yourself the question, are you staring at yourself too much? Because we don't grow and heal by staring at ourselves. Okay, number two, let's look at the second one. They don't show interest in your life. What I would encourage you, and this I think is very important, when we talk about narciss narcissistic tendencies, this influences a lot of modern culture, is to practice what, what can be called pitch and catch in relationships, meaning you're not just doing all the talking. You're not, do, you're not dominating the conversation. You're sharing, you're listening. In fact, I encourage lean more on the listening side, active listening, because being a good listener makes people feel safe. And learn to ask questions that open up where people can talk about themselves in a safe way and they feel connected to you in that. Now, narcissists may listen, but they're listening in judgment, or they're listening in a way to take this material and, and hold it against you later on in life. Listen well and actually show that you are listening by what you share back. Don't respond back with just another story about yourself. James's exhortation in James 1.19 says, Be swift to hear, slow to speak. Narcissists are the opposite. And just because you're slow to hear and, and quick to speak doesn't automatically mean you're a narcissist. But just understanding narcissists, they will, they're just waiting to say what they need to say to bring detention back to themselves. So listen and show you're listening. A third one that we could really benefit from is understanding that the influence of narcissism, it, it breeds on entitlement, a sense, an extreme sense of entitlement of what I'm owed. And as Christians, it is so helpful that we can actually combat the enemy of entitlement by living a life of practicing regular gratitude. Gratitude not only grounds us, gratitude humbles us. It turns us to God in healthy ways. In fact, the Bible says we enter his gates with thanksgiving. You want to connect to God in powerful ways? The pathway of gratitude can lead you there. First, uh, First Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks. When we, when we ground ourselves in gratitude, it drives out entitlement, because entitlement breeds anger, entitlement breeds self-focus, entitlement distorts our perspective. And I think many of us in our journey could benefit. It doesn't mean you're a narcissist, but we can benefit from going, you know what? I've got some areas in my life where entitlement's making me bitter. It's making me angry. It's causing me to lose perspective. It's keeping me from living a grounded and healthy life. So we can prevent that by leaning into gratitude. The fourth thing about narcissism I've talked about is they lack empathy. And I put this up here on the screen because it's important for us to understand. Healthy empathy, I put it here. It's make it about compassion for the other person with no gain for yourself. It's like, I'm, I'm just here to connect to what you're going through. Be a good listener in a compassionate way to add mercy to how you see others. That you're, 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 you're connecting compassionately to what the other person is going through. It reminds me of the scripture that Paul said in Romans 12, 15, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That's a powerful way of practicing empathy. Now, where do you battle? Do you battle when someone's going through a hard time? Are you dismissive of it and their pain? When someone has something good happen, does it trigger that envy in you? Why didn't it happen to me? A good way for us to heal and mature is actually learn to celebrate with those who have breakthrough, to celebrate with those who have blessing, and pause and have patient, compassionate mercy for those who are struggling. And what we, we tend to do is we don't give ourselves space to work on those muscles. 
When we see someone celebrating, we go into gossip and slander. We go into, oh, they didn't deserve that. You know, we get into all those things, right? And when somebody, we don't practice empathy, so we become very judgmental. The scriptures in Romans say mercy triumphs over judgment, but we are quick to judge when people are in pain, right? Well, if they did this, well, if they did that. And it disconnects us from mercy, which is God's compassion on us in our suffering, in our sin, and in our struggle. We want to lean compassionately, especially to those around us, the important relationships around us. The last one is, number five, is the gaslighting problem which is uh, so mind-bending in what it can do to people's lives, right? I don't want to be a gaslighter. Satan is a gaslighter, and we don't want to participate in that, right? So how do we practice healthy perspectives? Well, first, be willing to hear and listen to other perspectives. Be willing to hear other people's viewpoint. Be willing to take in other input. Another thing that I say often, and this is a a term that I I want to encourage you to cultivate in your life, be reasonable. Be reasonable. When when there's conflict and there's different perspectives going on, can you enter into it and have a reasonability? Or is there just a stubbornness, hard-headedness, hard-heartedness that um, only see things your way and that's it? You don't allow your perspective to get grounded because helpful input can help balance out your perspective and how you see things. Ephesians 4.15 says, speaking the truth in love so so we can grow up in all things, right? Well, I need to be willing to hear the truth when it's arriving in love because someone can speak the truth in love all day. Am I willing to hear it? And here is something that a narcissist will not do. They will not take in the truth even if it's super duper wrapped in love and compassion. They won't take it. And even if they just nod their head, they'll walk away in anger. They won't apply it. So where do you find yourself in this journey where this can be helpful for your life? And I think above all, the exhortation Peter gave is a great one. First Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Humility is not putting yourself down. Humility is not self-rejecting. Humility is just recognizing there's things I need to learn and know that I don't necessarily have mastery over. And God, I depend on you to help me. And in my relationships, I'm open to being taught. I'm open to being vulnerable in my journey, knowing that I'm flawed, knowing I'm still healing, knowing I'm still growing. And that's actually a way you can heal from narcissistic influence is by walking in humility because that pushes back the tide of what narcissism seeks to bring. And it'll help change the lives of those that you have influence over. Humility is incredibly powerful. If this resource, if this broadcast has been a blessing to your life and your journey, would you do me a favor? Click the like button, click subscribe, go to markdehesus.com. You'll find all all kinds of great materials, resources. You can go to my topics page. There's a whole free online library at your disposal. You can click on different topics to check out something that may be helpful for you. There's also my books, my latest book being The OCD Healing Journey, Getting to the Heart of Our Obsessive and Compulsive Struggles. We also have the Healing and Freedom Community that you can join if you want to make an investment, a next step to course material to be able to ask questions and to do some interaction on the things that you're working through, that's available today by clicking on the community tab at markdehesus.com. You can also support these broadcasts by a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter of the ministry work. Well, Lord willing and the creek don't rise. This is your brother from another mother saying, I'll be back with more insights and tools for your healing and freedom journey. But in the meantime, yep, I'm out.